This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. We got a banger for you today. I have Mr. Jamie Shanks, the CEO of Pipeline Signals, and we're going to talk about CRM, leads, production, all of that stuff, and how they can help you. So I'm really interested to hear what they have to say, and I know you are too. Jamie, what's cooking? I'm here at my cottage on Lake Simcoe, an hour north of Toronto, Canada. So when you hear it in my accent, I am a Canuck. Wow, I didn't I didn't pick up on it, so you disguised it well. Um, <laughs> I try. Yeah, there you go, there you go. So give why don't you give us a little bit of background information first, sort of give everybody the the what for as to where you came from, how you got to where you're at today, and then we'll dive into pipeline signals because that the meat of this conversation for sure. I've been uh, enabling producers and sellers m- most of my life. Essentially, ten years ago. I pioneered and invented a type of sales category called social selling. I wrote a couple books on the topic and my company Sales for Life enabled 600 global customers around the world, um, quarter million sellers or producers enabled around that, uh, around that time. And essentially what we were pioneering was the ability to use LinkedIn as a means of business development. A year ago, we decided to spin out a managed service slash SaaS software company that actually does the work on behalf of producers in the insurance business. So what that means is that we're able to dive into all of your accounts and monitor them for job changes, relationship connections, and competitive intelligence. Yeah, and so when when you and I talked about this, like literally the first question I'm out, out of my mouth was, oh, so kind of like a LinkedIn sales navigator on steroids, but it's more than that. It's more that the software actually does it for you. And I think, look, people, if you're listening to this and you have Sales Navigator and you're like, eh, I don't need this because I have Sales Navigator. Come on, man. I know better. I've had Sales Navigator for six years. I pay for it every single month and I don't use a single thing that it does other than the in-mail and the ability to see contact information. I don't have my list set up the way I need to. I'm not getting the press release notifications like I should be. And the, at the end of the day, it's because I have to do it. So we get so busy in the production game that sometimes just having that one desk, you know, that one little dashboard you can look at that says these are all the things you need to know today, this week, this month, whatever, makes our lives a lot easier because it's not that there's not – important stuff out there we're just not getting to it right like the closest thing i have to that jamie is you know i'm i'm a very in in certain things in my life i'm a very habitual person in other things it's just a white knuckle ride man and hope it gets done but i can assure you every single day two things when i come into my office are going to happen number one i'm going to read the tampa bay business journal i want to know everything going on in the business community in tampa today or what happened yesterday or whatever else That's always going to happen. Number two, I read my book from John Maxwell, Leadership Promises for Every Day. It's a devotional, but it has a good business message in there as well. And I don't do anything at all in my office until I've done those two things every single day. That's where it stops. Everything else is a free-for-all. So if it's something where it's left to my own devices, I'm in trouble. I think we're really, really good when we get the appointment booked, right? You know, the producer wants to go get the deal. They want to get the money. They want the commission. And so they're going to research the living daylights out of that prospect. They're going to have absolute intensity in all things they do to go after that. 
and then they become a client, or they don't buy the first time, and then what? They just sort of sit out there and, and hang out and hope for the best. You solve that problem, though. Yeah, let me explain. Let's kind of go through a situation problem or situation challenge resolution here. So you're a producer in Chicago. And so I'll use real life examples. Hub International, customer of ours out of Chicago. Producer lives in Chicago. You, David, are a producer in Tampa, Florida. So a chief financial officer leaves one of your customers in Tampa, ups and leaves and moves to Chicago. You in LinkedIn notice that somebody left your total addressable market. You care about Tampa St. Pete's. Now you no longer care because John Smith ups and leaves as the CFO from a company in Tampa, moves to Chicago and you think, well, I don't serve that market. All of a sudden, it's out of sight, out of mind for yourself. Well, there's on your end, somebody will replace John Smith. So you need to wait to capture that intelligence. But more importantly, now I'm the producer in Chicago. That producer doesn't have LinkedIn Sales Navigator. That person didn't come into work that day, didn't set up these natural alerts. And all of a sudden, the CFO joins an account in Chicago in which they are a producer following manufacturing firms in the state of Illinois. They miss that opportunity. And now it's awaiting a competitor to identify it, give them a call, because in that first 100 days that that executive takes that job, they will either physically or mentally deploy up to 70% of the remitted budget for the year in 100 days because they need to make an impact. So that's one example. Now you multiply that across a firm. Every single day, every single week and month, the average CRM is decaying at 3% a month. So CFOs, controllers, presidents, Lines of business leaders, risk, compliance, whomever is your ideal customer profile, they are changing in, up, and out of every company that you look after. And the question is, the people that are going in and out of these businesses, are they friends or are they foes? Are they connected to a competitor? Are they connected to a, a customer? Instead of you spending all your time doing these $5 an hour tasks to capture this intelligence, you are named a producer for a reason. Your job is to create financial impact and doing $5 an hour tasks is detracting from those core competencies. Discovery call, as you just described it, once you get the meeting to close, you're a winner. But how do we get more meetings? And that's what my company yep. does. Well, I think it's that. And I think it's also how, how do we preserve our retention figures too, right? Because... You don't want to find out that the guy coming in to replace or the lady coming in to replace the CFO that quit is coming from a place where they have a longstanding relationship with your competitor and all of this other stuff. So, I mean, knowledge is power. Obviously, the more you know, the better off you are. I do think you make an interesting comment I, and maybe even expand on that a little bit. But you said that your CRM is decaying at 3% a month. What does that actually mean? Yes. So that means that if you look, it's called a total addressable market. So a total addressable market for yourself, you are a producer that cares about the state of Florida and primarily the city of Tampa and St. Pete. I can tell you, I am a producer that cares about the five counties around Tampa Bay only. Outside of that, it is not an ideal prospect for us. Perfect. So in an ideal CRM situation for yourself, you would have populated every company in those five counties that is of the right size, the right vertical or industry that meets your idea, what's called an ideal customer profile. Let's say there Which was, we a, let's say there was 1000 accounts, 1000 accounts populated in your CRM. Now inside every account in a complex sale, there's five to seven and there's the book called the challenger customer would dictate that there's 7.4 decision makers, champions, influencers, and power users that make up what's called the buying committee. The buying committee is, uh, again, you're, you're, you're buying insurance. This isn't just a singular decision maker. Many times there is a committee of people that have input to making that decision. So you multiply 1,000 companies times, we'll make this math simple, five decision makers, champions, and influencers in every account. That's 5,000 people in the greater Tampa area that you care about. Now, statistically, every month, 3% of those 5,000 people will either move out of that company to another one 
or get promoted and move to There's a different that Canada, position. by the way. They're out. moving out. I'm the big <laughs> out for you. So what will happen is the data that you had in your CRM, 3% of that no longer is valid. Over the course of one year, 3 times 12, your CRM will have turned over 50% over one year. So to counteract that problem, you need to be backfilling it and counteracting it with all the changes. And a human being is the one that makes a decision in a business. You know, if I worked at, I'm drinking a Perrier here. If I worked at Perrier, Perrier, the company, doesn't wake up every day to make insurance decisions. It are the people that are within that company that make those decisions. They bring with them priorities when they're hired. And when they get promoted, they take priorities upstairs. And when they leave, priorities walk out the door. And your job is to follow the human capital because it's that human capital that will make all the decisions. That makes sense. We um, we use HubSpot. I've spent about $300,000 building out HubSpot. The people who listen to the podcast are well aware of that. And, you know, we have a unique situation here. And, and listen, you're speaking my language, man, because I think that one of the issues that agents and producers have is they don't even take the time to identify who their ideal prospect is and create a profile around that and stay in their lane, right? I think that you need to have three to five ideal prospect profiles um, depending on what you're doing in the insurance world. Now, if you're a niche player and you've got a very specific niche that you're responsible for and you do really well with that, then stick with it, right? But if you're a general agency, you don't need to be a generalist across all industry. Find like the three to five things you're going to be really good at that you have the companies to support, the value proposition to deliver, and all of that, and you're good. So what we do is we use a lot of free public information. Um, you know, the Department of Financial Services in Florida is a good one because I can go there and I can download every single company by county, by expiration date that has an active workers' comp policy in the state of Florida in that county. So that's what we do. We start with that, right? That's the that's the top of funnel. You don't get any more top of funnel than that. Perfect. We have no information. We have no contact, nothing. And then that's the beauty of technology for us because with HubSpot, literally our, our main point of qualification to start out with is we just put the root domain in HubSpot. Once we put that into the company record, HubSpot goes out, scrapes the internet, and gets the demographic data. So we can then create our call lists and everything based off of the right number of employees, right sales volume. And it's it's not an exact science because it's what you're getting for free from public domain, but it's close, and it helps you get the stuff that the national accounts that are way too big for an agency like mine to go after, and it calls the stuff that's more like a Main Street agency uh, type business, you know, the smaller commercial and things like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that business. It's like I tell people, we just actually talked about this in sales meeting. I'm, I love small businesses. I'm one of them, right? But I'm not designed to service them. So when people call in and they have an insurance policy that's like $2,000 a year, I have to respectfully decline to work on that for them. I don't have the right insurance companies. It doesn't fit our value proposition. You know, we're, it's just not profitable for us to do it. And we can't put our stamp of approval on that relationship because of those things. So it's a whole different animal. Now, if you're a $250,000 premium account that calls in, you're right in my wheelhouse. In fact, 250 to five is where we live. So we do exactly what you said. We start at the top. We, we, we qualify everybody. We make sure that it's the SIC codes that we want to write, that it's the right size in terms of sales volume, the right size in terms of number of employees. And then once that happens, we're off to the races at that point. We're monitoring social, right? We want to see the profiles of the different executives. We try to connect where it makes sense, but I'm not a big fan of over-connecting or, you know, just hollowly connecting. I'll typically limit myself to the number of people that I will connect with on a given month on an outbound arrangement because I send every single one of them a voice message on LinkedIn when I connect with them so they know I'm a real guy, not a spam bot. But where we drop the ball is exactly what you said you guys do. Now, the other thing that we talked about um, from a from an integration standpoint was you can you have the ability to integrate with CRMs or are you operating as a standalone CRM? Integrate with CRMs so and standalone. So essentially, there are three different models. You can have direct CRM integrations, things like Salesforce. You can have what's called Zapier integrations, push pulls into CRMs like HubSpot. And then there are many organizations that will work directly off of CSV files. 
Google Sheets and CSV files because producers are not accustomed to their CRM and they just need the information in their inbox so they can make informed decisions every Monday. So we work in all facets. I can promise you that when you spend the kind of money I've spent to build out HubSpots, producers know how to go in the CRM. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way for me to get my money back if they're not, yeah. right? So that that's interesting to know, though. And, I mean, to your point, you know, I started out with a spreadsheet. <laughs> you know, it, it was a laptop. It was a spreadsheet. I would craft my email message in Word, and then I would do a mail merge with the contacts from the spreadsheet through Outlook using the Word document. I mean, it was very, very convoluted, but that was also 20 years ago. Now it's a much more seamless process for us, but that's a very valuable, um, it, it's a very valuable kind of a, a niche spot in the market that you fill. Well, and the biggest piece, the signal that pays for itself in spades easily is called customers moving into accounts. So when a CFO, corporate controller, name your ideal customer profile, ups and leaves, one of those companies in Tampa inevitably joins as the CFO of company ABC in Tampa. When you call those people, they're three to five times more likely to take your call. Uh, they have a three to five times higher conversion rate because you have a what's called a fan, an advocate inside that business. People buy from people they like and trust. People buy from people they, they know. You have all the ingredients of what we'll call an asymmetric competitive advantage. And so that's the biggest thing that we need to be able to monitor is within all of Tampa, there are CFOs and presidents moving from one company to the next within your own customer base. Opening ability for you to open the doors of those prospects grows exponentially every time you grow your customer base. Yeah, I think. It would be interesting. You may have stats on this. I mean, any idea how many agencies? I mean, there's like 37,000 independent agencies. Or it's between 35 and 40,000 in the United States. I wonder how many of them have CRMs. Do you have any data on that? No, I don't know. And in fact, so we're pioneering this space called relationship signals. And, you know, we're just diving into the insurance world now. Um, you know, Hub International being a customer. And so it will be interesting to see as we expand throughout the insurance industry, what percentage use Salesforce versus HubSpot versus pipe drive versus no CRM at all. Now, you know, CRM, you know, globally still only had something like a 10 or 20% um, penetration rate of businesses over a million dollars around the world, right? So there is still a vast majority of companies that do not use CRM. Well, and you're in one of the most archaic industries that there is when it comes to the adoption of technology. We're last, man. I mean, even the insurance carriers themselves many times are very, very slow to move to adopt new technologies when they become available. So, I, I mean, if I'm if I'm your business development guy, whoo, that's a blank canvas for me, brother. I mean, I, I've got to believe the opportunity is there. Um, it'll just be interesting to see how many agencies realize that this is actually a problem that needs to be solved. And I'm not saying that in a way to throw shade at you. I believe 100% it's a problem that needs to be solved. I've already admitted it's a problem you can solve for me because I lose track if I don't get those LinkedIn alerts or whatever else. And truthfully, that's only as good as those people's keeping their LinkedIn updated anyhow, right? Well, I, that's the biggest problem. Yeah, what I say to people is... Um, specifically in professional services, in insurance, you know, what are you selling? You are not selling a product or a solution. You are first selling yourself. You are in the relationship space. I've been in ProServe most of my life. So if I'm selling myself, thus the relationships I have forged and will forge in the future, my relationships are my currency. So if I can reverse engineer all of those relationships that have come and gone, which you can't possibly track as an individual producer at scale. And then at the head of your organization, what's known as revenue operations, sales operations, to look at this across all of your producers, it becomes an exponential exercise. That's what we do. We are correlating and crunching all that intelligence at a global level. Every job change that matters. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think we dropped the ball on that. What um, 
So talk a little bit about social selling, man, while you're doing it. I mean, let's, let's talk about that for a second. You seem to have some experience there. Talk about how your experience doing that morphed into what you're doing now. Yeah, social selling uh, basically broke into two, course, uh, two courses and two avenues. One of them is fishing with a net. So think about it as reputation management or brand management. For yourself to build an online presence, a lot of people will call it trusted advisory. To become a trusted advisor, how do you make it so that people come inbound to you as a magnet? And that mm -hmm. came with changing your social profile, sharing content on a continuous basis, building a social network on like a flywheel basis. Well, that was for the first half. The second half is then account-based sales development. So being able to look objectively at your total addressable market and segment it into different quadrants. From there, look for signals of accounts and then select accounts and prioritize accounts based on objective data. Like why am I focused on account A versus account B today, not tomorrow? Well, I'm going to do it because a signal popped up. From there, I build a quick account plan. I engage using tools like video in a bold and different way. These are, these, this is what I spent 10 years doing, uh, teaching this. And what became evident was that sellers wished that you could do it on their behalf and give them the answers to the test and say, call Perrier today because these three things just happen inside that organization. Give them a call. Yeah, I mean, it could be something as simple. The action could be something as simple as we had my friend Darren Dawson, the CEO of BombBomb on. I yep. don't know if you're familiar with his email product or not, but we had him on. I mean, it could be something as simple as you just send in a video bomb bomb message to that person saying, hey, I wanted to let you know I'm really happy for you. I hope things are working out. Your family's getting moved in and just, you know, I'm not here to bug. I just wanted to let you know I'm thinking about you. Hope everything Absolutely. works out well. And that's it, right? But the problem is this. Hey, man, let me know when you get everything set up and you're ready to talk about moving your insurance over. I'd be happy to come talk to you. That, that's where we go, right? We go in the insurance industry specifically from what could be a really good relationship building tool, right, to completely shutting somebody off because you were never interested about what? them to begin with, right? You're basically It's a first date, that. and you said, hi, my name's Jamie, and you went, and you leaned in for the big kiss, and you've been there for 15 seconds. Yeah. It's the same yeah. Thing. Or it's like the people that use all the automated stuff. That's one of the things. So here's, the, here's my thing. When you say fishing with a net, there still has to be an educated approach to that, oh, course, right? Yeah. We're in an age right now where there's so many people that are using bots and everything else in tokens to extract information from social profiles, push it out to direct messages. Like I literally, if I, I'm, I'm at the point now where I have to look at every single connection I'm adding to my network. I used to be an open connector. My problem is I'll connect with somebody now and within 10 seconds, I've got an epistle telling me all the reasons they have the best product for my agency. And then sometimes they're a competitor with me. Like it, they, they're not even paying attention to who it is they've connected to. And they've, and so a lot of agencies, I think, get to the point where they push it away. They, oh, I'm not going to do that. I hate getting messages on LinkedIn. I hate getting this. I hate getting that. When, it, when, when, I see other, when I see the industry moving right, I'm moving left because to me, all the people that are doing this bad are creating an opportunity for somebody who feels like they're exceptional at social engagement to come in to fertile ground and win those people back over. And so that would be my challenge to the producers out there. Look, there's a lot of crappy marketers on LinkedIn that are taking the easy way out and their end user, the people they're trying to sell to, they understand that. Right. That's why I use my middle initial in my profile. Anybody that sends me a direct message that says David R. I know they never they didn't send that to reach out to me. They had software do it. Right. I have a friend that put a middle finger emoji in his so that when they did it, it flicked them off when it sent them the message back specifically. So, you know, don't discount how important this stuff is. That's the thing. If you have a sincere and genuine approach to going around re relationship building and trying to, um, you know, trying to, to open the door with people the right way, I think now is a greater opportunity than ever before because it gives you the opportunity to differentiate yourself in the ocean with a bunch of sharks, right? But you got to use your voice, you got to use your video, 
And if you're gonna if you're gonna create a custom message, just make it really quick and to the point, right? If I don't do a, 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 a voice message or a video, I'll just say, hey, look, thanks for connecting. I promise I'm not a guy that's going to spam you. I do share a lot of stuff on my own profile. Feel free to check it out. But in the meantime, if I could ever do anything for you, please let me know. This is the only time you'll probably hear from me. What do I do then? Well, I watch them. Now they're in my ecosystem. I'm not going to go like everything they post. I'm not going to comment on every single thing that they post. I'm going to be very cautious about how I do that. I'm going to get them accustomed to the fact that I'm interacting with their stuff because people pay attention to that. They're not going to pay attention to it if I like one thing they post a month that's something that's been impactful to their organization. They're not going to think about it if I you know, once a quarter send them a direct message saying, hey, I saw you guys in the news. This makes sense. But if they see you liking every post and commenting and everything, they're going to know that the whole thing's bogus, right? You have to have the right cadence in your marketing approach from a social perspective to make it stick. Yeah, we actually called that a social selling routine. And that was that's part of what's taught. And it's an, it's an exercise that works on a flywheel for 30 minutes a day. Because if you're doing this for more than 30, uh, 30 minutes a day, you're no longer producing, right? You were, No, you're playing, you're playing on, social on social media. media. So you're detracting <laughs> from the core outputs i mean at the end of the day you're 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 paid on outputs now these inputs uh compound over time to make a big a big impact but it's a 30 minute dance that essentially that you do every day that help you get in a position to stack the chips over time yep i agree well, what have we missed, man? What do you want to? What do you want people to know about pipeline signals we haven't talked about? No, I, I would just say that as an individual producer, if you look at one or two events for yourself, one, you have no idea what are all the potential opportunities in your given market. Okay, there is a way to objectively focus on which accounts you segment and prioritize, and that is when a compelling event has happened. We call it relationship signals. So if you're in that camp and you're trying to build a book of business because you want to know who to call, objectively, the best people to call are those that are new to organizations. Second camp, you are a more seasoned producer and organization where you have a long list of customers. The fastest way to scale your business is reverse engineer your happy customers called the sphere of influence and identify those that leave your happy customer in a sphere of influence and go to other businesses. You can't possibly do this on your own, nor is it a great use of your time. Let us mine that intelligence for you and deliver you a report so that you're talking to your past customers, your fans. Those are the two major use cases. Perfect. Well, how do they find you, man? Go to pipe, yeah. I mean, if we're, we're going to wrap up, tell them how to get Yeah, go to pipelinesignals.com. Uh, you can look at me up on LinkedIn, Jamie Shanks, and I'm here to help be able to show you some of uh, the best practices that we're now running in the insurance space. Beautiful. Listen, people, PipelineSignals.com. Jamie Shanks, he's the CEO. He is who our guest has been for the last several minutes. And I highly, highly encourage you, if nothing else, just go to the website and check it out. See what they can do for you. I am not getting paid by Jamie to recommend this to you. And he'll tell you that, right? We we didn't even know each other before we jumped on this podcast this morning. I just realized that what his company does is such a need for us that we needed to talk to him and get some agents going his direction to help them with this piece of the puzzle. I can assure you you're going to hear from us directly, Jamie, at Florida Risk Partners. But I do thank you for spending time on the Power Producers podcast today. That's PipelineSignals.com. He has been Jamie Shanks. Thanks so much for taking time out of your day to chat, my friend. Thanks friends. so much for the invite. We'll talk soon. You've been listening to the Power Producers podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com.